The women wore hoop skirts and powdered wigs. The men wore embroidered silk jackets and expressions of cautious amusement. As for Wolfgang von Kempelen, the 36-year-old Hungarian inventor, he too was dressed appropriately for the court of Empress Maria Theresa of Austria. But it was his companion whose manner of dress and behavior caught attention and raised eyebrows that day at Schoenbrunn Palace in 1770. His companion was dressed in flowing robes of plush red velvet and white fur trim. A turban covered his head, completing the outfit of an Ottoman Turk and giving him the appearance of some kind of mystic. He had a long wooden pipe in his left hand, but he never brought it to his mouth to draw smoke. In fact, he didn't move at all, staring straight ahead, the features of his dark-skinned face unexpressive, his gray eyes unblinking, his full mustache never betraying a frown or a smile, his thick brow cocked in a permanent skeptical slant. That is, until Kempelen wound him up. Because the Turk was an automaton, a mechanical figure that moved and acted of its own accord with lifelike motion. And automata were all the rage, delighting royals and commoners alike in the 18th century. In courtly courts, in vaudeville halls, in public lectures, people would pay to see humanoid musicians, figures that could write and draw. Even a digesting duck, a mechanical figure that looked like a duck, moved like a duck, and ate and even pooped like a duck. It was a new age where science was becoming a performing art, where inventors became showmen, their mechanical marvels becoming star attractions on grand tours throughout Europe, and giving a human voice and face to technology. An age of the inventor as a public figure, nearly a century before the world knew names like Edison or Bell or Tesla. And Kempelen was sure to make a name for himself because his Turk was going to be the most impressive automaton the world had seen to date. It didn't just simulate human movement, although it could do that. It could think. In their simplest forms, machines change the direction or magnitude of force. The pulley lifts up when we pull down. The lever allows us to lift more than we could without it. The earliest known example of a simple machine is the hand axe found more than two million years ago in what's now Ethiopia. By chipping pieces of flint into the shape of a crude wedge, our prehistoric ancestors were able to turn a downward striking motion into lateral splitting force. From then on, it's been our nature to create ever more complex machines, to make work easier, to multiply our limited human abilities but always behaving like machines, like collections of interconnected gears and cogs and powered by steam or hand crank or wind-up clockwork, built to serve us and readily turned off or disassembled. And here at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, people were just getting used to the idea of machines automating and replacing human labor, of internal combustion engines and steam power and mass production, of boundless new possibilities. But mimicking lifelike human movement was one thing. Exhibiting the things that made us intelligent, the ability to see, to recognize patterns, to make logical deductions and inferences, to imagine future outcomes, to think and strategize. Well, that was something new. No inventor in the 18th century had ever staked a claim like that. Until that day in 1770, in the court of Maria Theresa. The Turks sat behind a gleaming oak cabinet, three and a half feet long and two and a half feet high, with several doors and drawers. And on top of the cabinet sat a wooden chessboard positioned in front of the Turk. The whole operation was mounted on casters, and Kempelen rolled it smoothly into view of his audience. He opened the drawers to reveal an intricate system of polished brass gears and cogs and wires, rotated the contraption to show the back. More doors opened to reveal more machine works. As the assembled courtiers leaned forward and craned their necks for a better view, Kempelen held up a candle to let the light shine straight through the cabinet from front to back. He closed all of the doors and opened a drawer at the bottom of the cabinet and took out the 32 pieces of a standard game of chess, carved ivory chessmen of red and white. He set up the chessboard, placing the white pieces at the Turk's end. Then he moved to the side of the cabinet and twisted a brass wind-up key several times. From behind the cabinet doors came the tick and whir of a machine in motion. 
Now the real demonstration could begin. The Turk was ready to play a game of chess. He would play against anyone willing to accept the challenge. And Count Ludwig von Kobenzl stepped forward and was quickly and decisively defeated. The courtiers could barely hide their disbelief as the mechanical hand of the Turk moved the pieces, responding to the Count's tactics and strategies, capturing enemy pieces and defending his king, nodding his head to communicate when he had put his opponent into check. One of the women in attendance was said to have moved to the back corner of the room to distance herself from the Turk, because she was convinced that only demonic possession could explain what she saw, or what she thought she saw. Though Kempelin was an accomplished inventor, well-versed in physics and mechanics and hydraulics, who had invented an improvement on the steam engine and designed bridges and fountains and irrigation systems, who was a pioneer in inventing machines that could replicate human speech, he hadn't really invented a thinking machine that could match wits against a human opponent. He had created an illusion. But this isn't just the story of an elaborate hoax. It's also the story of our relationship with the promise and threats of new technology, our reaction to the all-too-imaginable idea of a machine that can think, and how even an illusion can introduce profound and troubling questions, and make almost as great an impact on the world as if it had been real. I'm Brian Earl, and this is Illusion. The secret of the Turk is common knowledge now, so there's no point in trying to protect it or build false suspense around it. Simply, very simply, it was a trick cabinet designed to hide a person sitting inside. All those gears, all that polished brass, none of it really did anything. Anything to help the Turk move or play, anyway. It did plenty to misdirect the spectator's attention and foil would-be theorists who tried to figure it out. Kempelin hired a skilled chess player to sit in the cabinet. A sliding cushion allowed the player to move out of sight at just the right moment when the different parts of the cabinet were open and exposed. He could see by candlelight when all of the doors were finally shut, could keep track of the game because the red and white ivory pieces were magnetic and attracted pieces of metal onto a duplicate chessboard inside the cabinet. The mechanical arm of the Turk was controlled by simple puppetry, but exposure of the secret was still years away from that debut in 1770, and Kempelin wanted to get back to his serious work in the field of speech replication. The Turk sat disassembled in storage for years, until in 1781, Emperor Joseph II, Maria Theresa's son, commanded him to present the Turk to the visiting Grand Duke and Duchess of Russia after which the dignitaries of the court urged him to take the Turk on an extended tour of Europe. And though Kempelin was reluctant, he agreed, because he needed the money to pursue his more serious scientific work. And so he continued to show his invention, continued to let people experience being in the presence of an intelligent machine. In Paris, where the Turk played and won against the American ambassador to France, a chess-loving fellow by the name of Benjamin Franklin, through Leipzig and Dresden and Amsterdam, through England, where a Reverend Edmund Cartwright saw the Turk in 1784, and believing that what he saw was real, applied his theory of how it worked to the invention of a mechanical loom, which would turn out to be one of the key steps in the mechanization of textile manufacture. All of this attention invited speculation about how the Turk worked. Of the nearly 400 attempted exposures to be published, some of them proposed that Kempelin himself was controlling the Turk, through magnets or invisible wires or some kind of remote control. Others had the basic idea correct, but they were wrong about the execution. One theory was that a child chess prodigy was hidden in the body of the Turk itself. Others proposed an amputee, or a person with dwarfism. In fact, the cabinet had plenty of room for a full-grown adult. But growing accusations of fraud would haunt Kempelin. People began to doubt whether his speech-replicating machines weren't also hoaxes. Some noted how one closely resembled a magic act called the Invisible Girl, where a doll appeared to answer spectators' questions. The exposures didn't seem to hurt the popularity of the Turk. Maybe it was because there were plenty of observers prepared to accept the Turk as a genuine thinking machine. Or maybe it's because all illusions live two lives. First as a moment of pure astonishment and enchantment, 
a moment where we feel the delight of experiencing a reality that can't or shouldn't exist. And second, afterward, as a puzzle to be solved, a challenge to figure out how it was all done. Whatever their reasons, people continued to come watch Kempelen wind up his clockwork Turk and watch the mechanical arm move the chess pieces and vanquish opponents, though sometimes losing when matched against a top-ranked player. After the tour of Europe, the Turk sat dormant once again. In Kempelen's later years, he even tried to sell it for 20,000 francs, but couldn't find a buyer. It remained in storage and was half forgotten at the time of his death in 1804. But that wasn't the end of the story for the Turk, who would go on to have a career revival of sorts as part of a traveling exhibition that included an automaton orchestra, led by a Bavarian musician named Johann Malzel, a friend and collaborator of Beethoven, who had invented a version of the metronome and several musical automata, including a trumpeter and a panharmonicon, which played the instruments of a military band. Malzel bought the Turk from Kempelen's family for half the original asking price, which of course meant that he would need to learn its secret and make some repairs to get it back into working order and hire a chess player to continue carrying on the hoax, which he did in 1809 when the Turk squared off against Napoleon Bonaparte, who tried to throw the Turk off by making illegal moves, tried to blind the Turk by covering its eyes, until the Turk had apparently had enough of the shenanigans and swiped his mechanical arm across the chessboard, scattering the pieces to the floor. Malzel spent years tinkering with the Turk, making its secret workings even less detectable, installing a voice box so that the Turk could say a check, using the French word to indicate that his opponent was in check, taking on lucrative engagements in Milan, in Paris, in London, where it defeated Charles Babbage, and even though he realized it must have just been a magic trick, it got Babbage thinking about what it would take to actually create a chess-playing machine. History remembers Babbage as the father of computer science, originating the idea of the digital programmable computer. And his first computer rose, in part, some people think, from his desire to believe that a real working version of a machine like the Turk were possible. Malzel took the Turk to America, showing it in New York and Philadelphia and Richmond, Virginia, where Edgar Allan Poe saw it in 1836 and published his own attempt at exposure. And though he got most of it wrong, the style of prose descriptions he used, of investigation and deduction, were an early blueprint for the stories he would later write that invented the mystery genre. But interest was starting to wane. And when Malzel died in 1838, a friend bought the Turk for $400. And it sat in a Philadelphia warehouse, and then in a dark corner of a Philadelphia museum, which caught fire in 1854 and destroyed the Turk, ending a strange and stunning career that began 84 years before, confounding a royal court, inspiring inventors and writers, delighting public audiences who paid five shillings to see the thinking machine that matched wits against Benjamin Franklin and Napoleon Bonaparte, and maybe more than anything else, raising unsettling questions about our relentless pursuit of newer and better machines, more capable of matching and surpassing human abilities, and also shining a light on what makes us human and what no machine will ever likely match. Our capacity for curiosity to experience the unreal and mysterious, the desire for a beautiful solution to a mystery, and how it often blinds us to the more obvious solution, like a puppeteer in a box, to ascribe human qualities to inanimate objects. Of course, the Turk had none of these qualities, nor was it afforded even the simplest instinct of all living things, the desire for self-preservation, it sat helplessly as its varnished body was engulfed in flames, its mechanical voice box succumbing to the heat as it repeated its dying words, a shek, a shek, a shek. Illusion is written and produced by me, Brian Earle. Search for Illusion Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and find show notes, etc. at illusionpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please consider leaving a review. It's a quick and painless way to show support, and it really does make a difference.